Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everybody. Those of you who are joining the Asia Society from around the, the world and our many centres uh, in Asia, our centres in Europe, but also our five centres in the United States as well, uh, and to our extended global audience. Uh, we're here for one reason, and that is because um, right around the world, not just in Europe, uh, everyone is focused on the events in Ukraine, what is happening militarily, what is happening uh, politically, the unfolding tragedy at a humanitarian level, and what, if anything, can be done in terms of diplomacy to bring this appalling war uh, to a um, satisfactory uh, conclusion, uh, which uh, maximises uh, the independence of the sovereign state of Ukraine. I'm very pleased uh, to be joined by friends and colleagues uh, who know this as an area of deep professional expertise. Uh, if I could begin by introducing my good friend and colleague, uh, Radek Sikorski. Uh, Radek is the former defence minister and foreign minister of Poland. He's currently a member of the European Parliament uh, and is uh, the chair of the EU-US delegation of the Parliament. Uh, Radek, uh, welcome to the Asia Society. Uh, we're also joined by my friend and colleague, uh, Carl Bildt, uh, former foreign minister and prime minister of Sweden. Uh, himself also uh, an expert uh, in uh, Russia, uh, having dealt uh, with the Russians not just bilaterally, um, but um, given his extended responsibilities elsewhere in Europe over a long period of time as well. And then finally, uh, Carl, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. And finally, uh, we have uh, Andrea Kendall-Taylor. Andrea uh, is currently with the um, Centre for New American Security, uh, joining us from Washington, D.C., uh, previously with the National Intelligence Council, previously with the Central Intelligence uh, Agency as a leading Russia analyst um, and therefore brings enormous expertise to this conversation as well. Um, Andrea joins us uh, from DC, as I said. Uh, Radek joins us from Strasbourg, the home of the European Parliament. And Carl, I think you're joining us from the United States, am I right? From DC as well, yeah. DC as well. So the format I'm going to propose to maximise our use in this hour is to go to Radak first for five to ten minutes to address two central questions. One, what is unfolding militarily on the ground and our best analysis of the military prognosis? And secondly, uh, what now of the politics and diplomacy given the pressure which uh, Putin uh, may or may not be under uh, in Moscow? Uh, and what, therefore, is the opportunity for diplomacy at this stage uh, or mediation at this stage in order to um, halt the bloodshed and to find some sort of political settlement? Um, so they're the two central questions that I want to pose to this group of eminent experts. Um, and um, and uh, Radek, over to you first. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Kevin. Um, well, this is not going according to the original plan. The original plan was to have a uh, short surgical operation that would uh, end almost before it started um, to uh, capture uh, Zelensky and the key um, members of the cabinet, uh, the defense minister, key uh, military personnel, change regime and be gone. And that clearly has not worked. More than that, the Russians seem to be bogged down. No doubt they'll try to resume uh, uh, the offensive, uh, but they have encountered far greater resistance than they were expecting. Um, it's partly because uh, they underestimated uh, the Ukrainians, partly because they believe in their own uh, propaganda that Ukrainians are not a real nation, they are just uh, Russians man care. And, uh, and that some of them will uh, greet uh, Russian forces uh, as liberators. And partly because, because of surprising weaknesses of the Russian military itself. What we can already say with certainty is that the myth of the great uh, uh, Shoigu modernization of the Russian military was just that. The majority of the equipment uh, that is uh, there in the battlefield is uh, the old familiar equipment uh, 
from the Brezhnev era, uh, same APCs and same tanks and same uh, uh, helicopters um, that were uh, that were t ambushed by the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s. Um, the, f the fog of war means that you can't rely on everything that you hear. Uh, the Ukrainians are claiming that they've already killed 11,000 Russian soldiers. If that were true, it would be astonishing. The official Ru Soviet death, death toll for the 10-year uh, occupation of Afghanistan in the 1980s was 13,000. Um, I would also say that they have not yet shot down enough aircraft and helicopters because those are still flying low. When they've shot enough of them, my um, working hypothesis is, is 100, uh, the pilots uh, will no longer um, go low for fear of their own lives. And a similar calculus goes for uh, tanks. Uh, the Polish generals that I've spoken to uh, thought that there were about 1,200 tanks in the invasion force, and they thought that if the Ukrainians managed to um, uh, destroy 300 of them, that's just tanks, not ca counting other vehicles, the, of the, the operation might grind to a halt again because of the morale of the crews. Um, it was always a, a little strange that the Russians thought that they could conquer a country the size of Ukraine with an invasion force estimated to be about 150,000 troops. Um, Ukraine is 60% bigger than Iraq and has an actual army. Uh, and the Russians uh, didn't have a straightforward uh, superiority of numbers even before the Ukrainian mobilization, let alone the three to one advantage that uh, according to the classic Clausewitzian principles you need if you are the attacking side. Uh, the Ukrainians made a couple of mistakes. Uh, Zelensky wasted three months because he thought it was a bluff. And he also only announced mobilization after hostilities actually began. But uh, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian men, and not only, uh, seem to have uh, rallied around the standard. You hear about a million Ukrainians coming to Poland as refugees, mainly women and children. You hear less about 80,000 uh, uh, Ukrainian men who have abandoned Polish uh, uh, building sites and have gone back to Ukraine. And Ukrainian uh, border guards do not allow Ukrainian men to leave the country. The mobilization directive is being enforced. Uh, we have learned today um, from the New York Times that supposedly 17,000 uh, effective Western-made anti-tank weapons have already uh, been delivered to the battlefield. Um, and of course, Ukrainians have their own perfectly capable anti-tank weapons. Your ordinary RPG-7 takes out most tanks. It, it's just more dangerous to the operator because you have to come much closer than, than with a Javelin or, or, a, um, or, or, or the Panzerfaust III. Um, if that is the case, that means that the saturation of these weapons on the battlefield in, in the various localities will be such that I don't see how Putin can win this. Um, on the contrary, if the Ukrainians manage to get through to that, not convoy, but traffic jam um, stuck north of Kiev, um, that force will be in huge difficulty. Those soldiers have been sleeping out in the cold without tents and without apparently fresh supplies of food and, and petrol for some days now uh, in freezing cold. This must be terrible for morale. And 
And the bombing uh, and shelling of uh, civilian quarters of major cities, apart from being a crime and, uh, and, 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 and cruelty, um, is actually a sign of desperation. It, we, when you have a military advantage and you're trying to take out the, the Ukrainian military, that's not what you do. Uh, this is the tactics of, uh, of an Assad who won't, who doesn't mind inheriting a pile of, of, uh, of ruins. Um, so I think uh, there may be some um, reality dawning on President Putin. I think he was badly misled by his military. Um, they hadn't prepared a second uh, echelon of forces that it's only being cobbled together now. Um, and what... Uh, a, 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 his spokesman, Mr. Peskov, has just said on the, literally, on the, um, not just Eve, but at the very beginning of uh, the third round of negotiations, maybe the Russians' actual position, which would be interesting, and this is how I'm addressing your second question, uh, Kevin. Um, namely, what's coming through is that the Russians want Ukraine to, to recognize the uh, annexation of Crimea into Russia, and the so-called independence of the two republics in their self-declared borders, which is to say uh, the Donbas. I would bet you anything that if uh, those conditions were met, uh, the Russians would also not leave the land bridge from Donbas to Crimea, including the sources of water. And the Russians apparently are also demanding that um, Ukraine uh, change its constitution to remove its aspiration to join NATO. Now, if we were in the traditional pre-democratic um, mode of politics, still run by kings and princes and, uh, and dictators, those would not be completely unacceptable conditions because there are no prospects for Ukraine to recover Crimea. There are no prospects for Ukraine to join NATO. And Donbas is a post-industrial hellhole that uh, Ukraine can't take back by force. And if those were the final conditions, which would mean Finlandization properly understood, namely Ukraine um, free to join the European Union and to integrate civilizationally and economically with the West, then that should give uh, Ukrainians some, something to think about. I'm not sure you can cede territory in a democracy and remain in power. Um, but if you can, under the threat perhaps of, you know, a, a catastrophic war, then maybe that's something to be considered. But I don't think we should be the ones telling the Ukrainians to do that because they know that their own politics best. But, but, but if, if these are the only conditions, then Putin must be understanding that he's, he's, uh, he's on the point of failure because... Um, these are not, uh, he can, there is enough in it for him to claim victory, but it actually wouldn't be victory. That's a, um, a very um, important introduction to conversation. I hadn't seen the Peskov statement. Is that simply out today um, in terms of these conditions? Um, but anyway, let's um, sustain our conversation. I'm going to bring in uh, Andrea next. Andrea, the two questions which uh, Radak has opened up, uh, please um, uh, give us your views, and then I'll turn to Carl. Over to you, Andrea. Well, I think Roddick captured the state of play quite well, and I think I agree with virtually everything that he said. Um, so maybe just to underscore a couple of points and add um, some context or a little additional um, perspective to what he said. I mean, as Roddick said, it's not going well for the Russians, and that's quite obvious. Um, in addition to everything that Roddick said, you know, we're seeing obviously the problems with supply chains. We see pictures of Russian soldiers going into Ukrainian grocery stores because they're not able to get food up to the front lines. We see the massive fuel shortages. 
as Radek said, I think we're also seeing very um, poor morale among the Russian forces. There's reports that Russian soldiers are punching holes in their fuel tanks, their equipment is being abandoned. And so it does make you wonder why Russia has performed so much um, so much worse than we all, I think, expected. And I think it comes back to the kind of quality or the, the very nature of the political system that is now inside Russia, which is this highly personalized authoritarian system. That personalization, I think, has been on full display ever since, um, well, it's obviously always been a highly personalized authoritarian regime, but some uh, additional indicators of that degree of personalism since Russia invaded have been on full display. We all saw the picture of the National Security Council meeting in which Putin kind of uh, dressed down each member of his national security establishment. And that to me really underscored that there is really no one left in Putin's inner circle who can constrain him. There's no one left who's really able to present information that is contradictory or opposed to his worldview. And that's a really problematic situation. It's clearly manifested in the planning of this operation. Um, so there, this operation, as Roddick said, was based on a number of very faulty assumptions it's remarkable, I think, that President Putin and the Kremlin weren't able to learn after 2015. You know, they had similar assumptions then. After they illegally annexed Crimea and went into eastern Ukraine, I think that they, they believed that their presence there was going to unleash a ground, an, a, you know, an outpouring of support for Russian forces, forces, which never came to fruition. I still think that that assumption was largely in place where there was a belief uh, inside the Kremlin that if you could simply decapitate this regime or their presence inside Russia um, would uh, not be met with the resistance that we have seen and that Radek talked about. Um, so they you know, have been unable to learn since 2015. This highly personalized system has created a lot of uh, faulty assumptions that have now caused the very poor performance that Roddick kept about. I think another interesting dynamic is that it seems likely that the Kremlin wanted to keep this operation out of the eyes of Russians. I think they understood that this operation was gonna be domestically unpopular. And so they wanted to get things done very quickly um, in order to mitigate and um, uh, reduce the potential for public backlash inside Russia. Now, as this drags on, um, that prospect only increases, and we can talk about that a little bit more in a second. I also agree with Roddick that I don't see how Russia can win this. I don't think that they are able to use their military to achieve their political objectives. It is clear that their plan A fell, has failed. As Roddick said, I think the initial plan was clearly to get to Kiev as quickly as possible, decapitate the regime, install a puppet government, and get out quickly. Um, now that that plan is no longer viable, it does seem like Putin's goals maybe have evolved. It's hard to say exactly what he went in to begin with, but it does seem from his statements, um, from some of the readouts from the French, for example, that he really is talking about the complete subjugation of Ukraine. It seems, you know, with his rhetoric about denazification of the regime uh, and of the country, it seems like he wants to basically um, wipe out Ukraine as a nation state and really subjugate the population. But as Roddick also said, they don't have the military force to be able to do that. And the resistance that we seem makes that an entirely um, unachievable objective. So the question is, where does this go from here? I still think it's hard to imagine um, exactly how this ends. It seems to me that it's most likely going to have to be resolved in some sort of negotiated settlement. And Roddick was talking about the contours of what that might look like. But the problem is, is that still both sides, I think, um, see things, see some optimism to advance their objectives. So clearly, I think President Putin hasn't let his foot off the gas yet in the sense that he still has these very maximalist objectives. He's still talking about recognizing Russian control over Crimea. He's still talking about the neutrality of the country and he's talking about demilitarization. Um, on the other side, I think Zelensky likely feels that things are going well enough that they're, you know, they're not going to be willing to give into those demands um, anytime soon. And so it does feel like we are kind of, you know, potentially looking at a protracted uh, conflict. Um, hopefully, over time, the two sides can inch closer together. And that's where I do think that some of the domestic pressure on Putin himself will hopefully play a role. 
Um, we have seen inside Russia that there have been protests in cross cities uh, all over Russia. Obviously, the regime is responding with a tremendous crackdown and increase in repression. Thousands of Russians have been arrested. We know that they've introduced new laws that uh, give up to 15 years of jail time for anyone using terms like invasion or using sources um, that don't come from the Russian government or from the Ministry of Defense. So they are doing everything possible, I think, to try to control the crackdown. We even saw some videos over the weekend where the Russian domestic security forces were randomly stopping Russians in Moscow, demanding to read their phones and look at their text messages. So they are trying very hard to crack down on this opposition because they do understand that this is not popular inside Russia just as the international community has had a sea change in the way that they view Russia now and the Putin regime, I think that's happening inside Russia. Um, you know, you talk to Russians ahead of this conflict and not one of them could imagine that, the, that Putin would actually invade Ukraine. And now that it's happened, at least those Russians who are aware of what's happening, I think um, this is really, be, this is unfathomable. Um, it's a huge injustice, and we know from the history of authoritarian regimes that it's these types of acute injustices that can serve as a trigger for mass mobilization against the regime. And so I think Putin, is, and he knows that. And I also think we've seen a lot more elite um, divisions, uh, a lot more elite dissatisfaction than anything that I've seen in a very long time covering Russia uh, the, you know, Luke Oil came out to oppose the war. We saw Abramovich selling the Chelsea Football Club and saying they will send the net proceeds to the victims of Ukraine. Um, there are all sorts of small signs of elite dissatisfaction that I think were largely absent in large scale protests like in, in 2011 and 2012. So I think Putin knows that his hold on power is more precarious now than it was before. Um, the question is, what does he do with that? Does it move him closer to negotiations as Roddick you know, was suggesting what the contours of that could look like? If Putin is facing this increased domestic pressure, is growing more concerned about regime survival, on the one hand, it could make him um, a more willing you know, uh, member of negotiations. It could make him more willing to get into negotiations and move a little bit on some of these maximalist concessions. But I think it is also just as likely that he really digs in his heels, doubles down on his political objectives, and it could lead to some very erratic and risky behavior. The other thing we know about these highly personalized authoritarian regimes is that, you know, I think they, they can expect after they leave office to be either jailed, and, you know, or, or exiled or killed. And if that is what Putin is imagining as his potential post-tenure fate, if he's getting increasingly worried about his own domestic standing, I do think it is plausible that we will see him double down and use every instrument of power in order to prevent his ouster. Um, and that puts us in a potentially um, risky situation. So while it is crucial that the West does everything possible to support Ukrainians, to help them defend themselves, um, we also have to be aware about the potential risks of escalation, the, the potential that this conflict could expand beyond Ukraine to potentially include NATO. Um, so we're going to have to thread that needle. In some cases, I do think that there are going to be some very hard moral compromises, right? You know, we know that the Ukrainians are calling for a no-fly zone. The United States and NATO has said no to that so far. So there are some very difficult uh, moral dilemmas here. Um, but I think, you know, we'll just, we have to kind of recognize, I think, the headspace that President Putin is in. And if he does feel embattled and cornered and that his hold on power is at risk, he could look, take steps to escalate um, this conflict. So I'll, I'll end there. Thanks very much, Andrea. The whole question of uh, military escalation is um, uh, frightening, fascinating in terms of where this could go and above all, dangerous. So let's come back to that now, general discussion. Um, Carl, you're a long-term analyst of what goes on in Russia. Uh, Sweden has a long history uh, with, uh, with Russia of uh, several centuries on uh, both sides of the equation, um, good and bad. Um, uh, any reflections you've got on the military scenario, but also the politics of the Kremlin now as well? Over to you. <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks, and thanks, Kathy, for getting us together to discuss uh, just a couple of remarks. I agree with everything that Radek and Andrea has said, obviously, um, but just sort of afraid it's uh, somewhat different from my point of view. We are now the, I think we are the 12th day into what is going to be something that's going to define Europe, define Russia, define Europe for a very long time to come. It is absolutely extraordinary decision taken by one man. Uh, can only be compared to Hitler attacking Poland in September of 1939. Uh, this was a decision taken by one man in a very small circle. As Andrea said, prior to this, it was very difficult to locate anyone in Moscow who said we needed an invasion. And uh, almost everyone that we are able to reach in different ways was surprised and opposed although they are now being silenced by sort of very heavy repression that is setting in. No Russian leader has done in history anything resembling this. You could talk about Nicholas II in 1904 attacking Japan, but that was seen as a fairly small war in a distant world. I mean, it ended in defeat for him, but that's another thing. But this is a very major thing by any Russian lead, by, by, by the standards of all Russian history, uh, this particular decision. Why? Well, if you have followed Putin in the last years, it's been a man who's been spending far more time talking about the past of Russia than the future of Russia. He's been diving down in the history, creating monuments, uh, trying to resurrect the past that cannot be resurrected. And that is reflected also in the war aims that he has. You have to go back to the extraordinary speech that he gave on Monday before launching the war. Uh, after the first this extraordinary session of the National Security Council to force them into, into line. And essentially what he said there was that um, he doesn't recognize uh, Ukraine as a nation, as a separate identity. And uh, he criticized the Lenin of all people for creating a, a setting up a Ukraine Republic inside the Soviet Union. And he wants to go back to sort of Tsar's times when the Tsar was deciding everything and there was no nationalities accepted or recognized inside the Russian Empire that, by the way, at the time was called the prison of nations and led to its demise. Radek, from the Polish perspective, can speak eloquently about that. But that's where he wants to go. That's where he wants to go. He makes that abundantly clear. And, and when he then elaborates further, he says, I want to demilitarize, which is another way of saying this should be under Russian security and military control. You want to denazify. And if you look at who if he defines as Nazis, well, he has publicly in the last few days described President Zelensky as a drug addict and a Nazi. Um, and virtually everyone uh, of the Democrats in Ukraine are described as Nazis. He wants to get rid of them. He wants co complete military and political control of a Ukraine that he wants to deny a separate existence from Russia. That's what Putin has said. Is this achievable? It's not. Um, but as long as Putin is in command of the Kremlin, and that's a big question in itself, he will escalate as until he thinks he can win. And I would say he will escalate until he wins or he loses. I find it difficult to see how he will win, even if he were to conquer uh, all of Ukraine militarily. Um, it's difficult to see, but say that he does that. He will be confronted with the West and an exiled government and the Ukrainian diaspora and a collapsing Russian economy in a way that would be very difficult for him to, to handle. So it's very difficult to see the win. So where are we then? We are in a scenario where he will escalate. He has already employed, I think, sort of somewhat more than two thirds of uh, total Russian military capabilities. That's quite a lot. He can do somewhat more, but not much more. But he can also escalate in terms of going up the nuclear ladder is one of the things. He can escalate in terms of cyber attacks. It can escalate in a number of other things directed also directly against the West. I think that is the most likely scenario. What can the West do? I think diplomatic options at the moment are very limited. He will only, he will only climb down when he absolutely falls to it. 
by sort of defeat or significant resistance on the battlefield. That is why Western policy at the moment is a combination of sanctions in order to try to drive change in Russia. Sanctions, uh, both sort of the decided ones and the voluntary ones, have been far more significant than anyone anticipated. Uh, when I talk to economists, I think the Russian economy is going to be down 10, 15 percent uh, this year. Inflation 50, 50 to 70 percent or something like that. And that the technology embargoes of different sorts are going to limit the possibilities for Russian industrial development for years to come, as long as this remains. Um, then building up, of course, support. I think Radek mentioned the large amounts of weaponry that is now flowing into anti-tank weaponry, primarily flowing into, uh, into Western Ukraine, that will make it very difficult for them. So we, we need to sort of tip the balance here, sort of uh, increase the pain for Russia as much as we can, increase support, not only weapons, but lots of other things, financial support, prevent the uh, collapse of the Ukrainian state, um, financial collapse of the Russian state, uh, in order to sort of change the the balance of forces until such time as there's a break in the Kremlin, the one way or the other. That's the only way in which it can happen. As for the ongoing negotiations, um, I don't put much trust in them. The one who's been negotiating or talking to Putin is uh, President Macron of France. He had an hour and a half again yesterday. And uh, if you talk to the French, their conclusion is it's going to get worse. Uh, when they talk directly to Putin, they see so far no opening whatsoever. So we are in the worst crisis of Europe since the defeat of Hitler. Um, uh, it's only the 12th day. It's going to get worse. It's going to transform Europe. It's going to transform Russia. We don't know where it's heading. Let me put, thank you very much, Carl. Let me just put this question. Let's pursue this escalation part of the equation. There's the negotiation option, there's the escalation option. Let's go through the escalation scenario that you've, all three of you have touched upon. Um, and Carl, you took it to a further dimension, not just military escalation in terms of the campaign in Ukraine, um, but a horizontal escalation in terms of the rest of Europe. Um, could I ask, and I throw this as an open question to all three of you, and, and jump in first, whoever wishes, What's military escalation look like in terms of what it could now do in, with Ukraine itself and the military operation, given the bulk of his forces are already committed? What can actually be brought further to the table militarily? Are we actually looking at the possibility of something beyond conventional warfare <clears throat> uh, in, in Ukraine? Um, and then the second question is, what would escalation look like with the rest of Europe um, and where? And to what end? So I throw that open to the panel. Who would like to have a go at that? Start with you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, a hard question. So I'm not a Russian military analyst, but I do think that, you know, we have seen, we now know that 90% of Russian forces that they had along the border are now being used inside Ukraine. Um, so they are there. Um, but there's been certain things that we, they have refrained from doing that I think we expected them to do much earlier. So in particular is the air power story. And so I think it is likely that we could see a lot more kind of heavy fires and, and kind of trying more efforts to dominate in the air. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that we already see signs of is you know, they could escalate in a sense by going after civilian populations. Um, we should expect that Russia uh, and the Russian forces will target those areas where they perceive there is the greatest resistance and opposition, and that is likely to be in civilian centers. Um, and this is part of Putin's strategy. I think, you know, we've all kind of talked about uh, subjugation, um, trying to bring Ukraine to heel. And so we should expect, I think, part of the strategy very well could be to try to demoralize Ukrainians, that they will continue to target these civilian centers. Um, we've already heard over the weekend, you know, with the humanitarian corridors that Russia has actually hit those areas um, intentionally, I think, in large part to demoralize uh, the, the Ukrainian population and to push back against this very strong resistance and opposition that we've seen. Um, so those are some ways I think, you know, there are additional ways I think that Russia can escalate. 
Uh, I think many of the Russian military analysts have been talking about the fact that after the opening days, we expected Russia to kind of regroup and then kind of adapt its tactics. And, and, and we are likely to move, as Carl was saying, into a much more dangerous, much more um, darker days in this conflict ahead. So I think we can expect uh, that to happen. Um, in terms of potential escalation or um, expansion of the war beyond Ukraine, I mean, I still think that that is a very real risk. And you could think about potential scenarios uh, in which fighting in Ukraine could create implications for NATO member states. As the United States and Europe continue to supply the Ukrainians, I think it will be a growing concern for the Kremlin. And it is very plausible that the Kremlin could look to hit supply lines um, it, you, and, and mistakes are made, right? And if one of those convoys is hit while still in Polish territory, for example, um, that is going to create very real implications that could uh, lead to an expansion of the conflict. Um, we've also talked about, you know, one thing that is missing actually could uh, is also the kind of cyber element, the electronic warfare that has been largely absent from this conflict so far. And if we do see a Kremlin decision to take out uh, critical infrastructure in Ukraine, electricity grids. We also know that those cyber attacks um, grow, right? It's very hard to contain um, the effects of those types of attacks. And so again, if those attacks spill over into na neighboring mem NATO member states, uh, how does NATO respond to that? Is that, does that trigger an Article 5 commitment? Is there, so I, you know, it is still possible that there are very difficult questions ahead. And then I think the other notable piece of this um, in respect to the United States is that we have not yet seen Putin retaliate for the economic sanctions. And given the very harsh impact on the central bank and on Russia's financial sector, um, one of the things that many analysts have talked about is the potential for cyber attacks against U.S. critical infrastructure, in particular our financial institutions. Uh, we haven't seen any major ransomware attacks, for example, like the one we saw over the summer on the Colonial Pipeline. Um, I think that's coming. I, mean, I do think, I think as Putin is kind of figuring out what his options are, we should expect a more aggressive posture. Um, so there, is, there are a lot of ways, I think, that in which this conflict could still uh, escalate, both in Ukraine, but also potentially spill over to affect both NATO um, and the United States homeland. Um, deeply disturbing. Radek, your thoughts on escalation, both um, vertical within Ukraine and horizontal elsewhere? Well, let me just say that um, uh, two sides can escalate. Uh, we have uh, hitherto behaved um, passively, as expecting Putin to act aggressively, and we have in advance signaled what we will not do, um, presumably as a reassurance to our own population that, uh, that we don't wish for a, a, a war with Russia, which indeed we don't. Um, but with the U.S. green light to allies such as Poland, Slovakia, and um, Romania to hand over um, uh, their legacy MiG fighters uh, to Ukraine to be flown from Ukrainian uh, airfields um, and with Ukrainian pilots, um, I, I think we have now drawn the line where we think um, uh, Russia can regard it as uh, an act of aggression. So anything below actually flying from NATO airfields and using NATO uh, personnel uh, seems to be fair game. And you could do a lot uh, to um, make Putin think twice um, um, uh, within those parameters. Um, let's remember that um, uh, Stalin lost 300,000 uh, men during the winter war with Finland, uh, and he only stopped it uh, when he heard of British planes in Azerbaijan, whatever mm -hmm. that meant. Uh, Russia is vulnerable in other places, and we are perfectly in our right to have a large NATO exercise in the Baltic states. In fact, we should be doing things to uh, beef up the eastern flank that uh, Putin has clearly endangered. We could also be exercising in the Far East. 
he has brought um, troops from the Far East to this operation in Ukraine. We could um, start putting uh, him in doubt as to what our intentions are and stop reassuring him about things that we won't do. Uh, and on the contrary, um, uh, make him uh, divide his attentions uh, to other theatres. Uh, Carl, your thoughts on escalation, um, Ukraine and, and beyond? Yeah, as Radek said, we can escalate. I mean, the US could have a major naval exercise in the Sea of Okhotsk, for example. Uh, there are virtually no Russian forces in, in, the, in, in the Far East. Um, I made a slight joke the other day and said that if we talk about ancient historical lands, as uh, Putin does, uh, the Mongolian army uh, has a free ride to Moscow now. There are no forces to stop them uh, because um, Putin has concentrated all of his military might. He might have some additional ground forces uh, that he can uh, send into Ukraine, but it's not much. It's not much. Um, I, I see that more in detail up in Northern Europe. It's, uh, it's rather bare when it comes to, to, to forces. They are all in, 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 in Ukraine. So some further in terms of further battalion battle groups to send into battle to just maul down uh, the Ukrainians. On the economic side, counter sanctions, uh, stopping uh, gas deliveries to Europe, uh, Nord Stream 1, 55 BCM is going to hurt the German, well, you have the Yamal pipeline that goes into Poland as well. Uh, that's going to hurt. Um, there is a lot of speculation, as you know, about his uh, possibility to employ nuclear weapons for demonstration or other purposes. I don't think that should be excluded. Cyber, as Andrea mentioned, there hasn't been too much of that, uh, surprisingly little so far. There has been, but surprisingly little so far. And um, what we see primarily on the cyber side is the different sort of hacker groups, um, significantly competent hacker groups attacking Russia. Um, so I think we are highly likely to see escalation. He doesn't have any other way of handling this. He will at some point in time understand that if this war is prolonged, it becomes even more dangerous for him. And that will give him even more incentive to escalate in, in different ways. Um, this sending fighter thing, uh, there are numbers of issues with that. I mean, you can send in Polish aircrafts. Roderick would know more about this. This is MiG 29s, but I think they have been probably modernized with NATO sort of. Um, cyber things or electronics or avionics or whatever. Um, so it might be that they will require pilots that are different from the Ukrainian pilots and there could will be volunteer pilots of different sorts. And here we go into what is going to be sort of difficult to distinguish who's who. And they These will are not require... pilots. You can be, buy a MiG fighter in any shop with MiGs. Yes, but aren't these MiGs that you have in Poland somewhat we modified? We have to remove the friend of foe uh, um, uh, trans transponders. Yeah, that you need to remove. But, but, the, uh... but you, a lot of escalation. And, and of course, what the Russians have now started to do is to take out their fleets in Western, Western Ukraine in order to make this particular option. But this could easily get out of control. I would say it's likely to get out of control likely to get out of control. So there we have a range of military uh, escalation possibilities uh, that have been discussed, Ukraine, elsewhere in Europe. Um, and then, of course, um, as Radek has just pointed out, Russia's own vulnerability uh, to, shall we say, counter escalation and other theatres, not least of which the Far East. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So it comes to, in my mind, to the question, given we are broadcasting a lot of this to Asia, uh, and our centres across uh, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Delhi, Mumbai, um, Australia, and the rest. Uh, what now um, is useful and effective for the international community to do uh, by way of uh, financial responses other than those already taken, broader diplomacy, um, uh, as well as other points of leverage with the Russian Federation? Um, so let me um, start with you, Radak, in terms of what can be done uh, from both Berlin and Brussels and other European capitals. But secondly, any reflections you have 
on what can be done by uh, in Asia, including by the Chinese, including by American allies in Asia as well. Ruddock first, and then I'll go to Andrea and Carl to take us out. Over to you, Ruddock. Well, the Scandinavians and the Anglo-Saxons were uh, proved reliable early on in this crisis, but medium term, the most significant change uh, will be the 180 degrees change of policy by Germany. Germany is going to start rearmament from a very low base. Uh, and Germany, uh, I think, will take steps to become less dependent on doing business with Russia, including in the uh, energy sphere, where we need to give uh, friendly advice to Germany is to do both the rearmament and energy policy in a European context. Um, you know, those who call for, for German rearmament today will be the first in five of year, or ten years' time to talk about its threatening nature when it actually happens. So Germany needs to rearm within a European context and European decision-making make, making about the use of force. So I think with this, the time for serious European defense uh, has finally come. And uh, we can also square the circle of um, needing to deter Putin while buying Russian energy by doing a gas union. We started as a coal and steel community. We are also a uranium union. Uh, if the commission were buying gas collectively on behalf of the member states, we would get a security of supply at a far more competitive price. As regards China, uh, you know much uh, better about it than I, but my friend and, and um, mentor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, used to say that the choice for Russia is to be either an ally of the West or a vassal of China. To be an ally of the West, you need to um, respect some basic principles which, which Russia has just trampled underfoot. Um, it's... Um, isolating itself from the West and becoming dependent on China. Um, for example, to be able to buy commodities in exchange or on credit on the security of its gold reserves. Uh, and I expect that the Chinese, uh, that China likes uh, that aspect uh, uh, of it. Um, and that puts China in, in a uniquely influential position, perhaps as being the only country who could, who could lean on Russia to end this conflict. Hmm. Um, but I'd love to hear more about that from you, Kevin. I'll come back to that as we wrap up. Uh, Andre, a few minutes from you on what the Europeans could and should do, uh, what China could or should do and what any other allies of the United States in Asia could or should do by way of diplomacy or other forms of economic leverage? I think the question of the nexus between Europe and China is very interesting. And I say that because I actually think that Europe does have quite a bit of leverage in articulating to Beijing that there will be cost to its efforts to bail Russia out. Um, I think you know, I was less certain about that before we saw this massive international response. It looked easier, you know, ahead of the conflict to imagine it was easier to imagine a world in where in which China could kind of sit on the fence, make its principled statements and continue with its business of bailing Russia out behind the scenes. But given this very dramatic international response, I think that is getting increasingly hard for Beijing to do. And given how important uh, Europe is for Beijing, you know, it is still a priority for China. And of course, you know more about this than I, um, but to keep, China, to keep Europe on the fence, so to speak, but to make sure that Europe isn't all in with the United States and pushing back on China. Now that we've seen such dramatic movement in European positions and its movement on sanctions, I think you know, that creates a lot of leverage for Europe to be able to communicate to China that there would be cost to Beijing if they are actively working to circumvent and dilute the sanctions that Europe has put in place. So I think that is an interesting kind of dynamic there. But I think just broadly, and I'd rather hear what Carl has to say about these things, but there's a number of things still left to do. I think that the sanctions on Russian um, oil are, are critical, and it looks like we're moving in that direction where we are likely to see sanctions or 
some sort of import restrictions on Russian oil um, sooner rather than later. That will be a critical move, I think, in continuing to ensure that Russia doesn't have the budget and the reserves to continue this aggression. I mean, let's not forget how expensive it is for Russia to sustain this conflict in, your, in Ukraine. It is extremely expensive. And if we can go after their economy, again, that puts additional pressure on Putin to find some way out of this. Um, I also think, though, there's it, 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 dynamics to think about in the information domain. Um, I think it's critically important that the United States and other allies and partners figure out how we can continue to get information into Russians, whether it's mobile Internet, satellite Internet, other kind of creative ways. We see the BBC, I think, using the radio um, and, and, and beaming in their broadcasts um, once a week to try to ensure that Russians have a more uh, accurate uh, and clear sense of what is actually happening. Um, there are tons of Russians that are now leaving um, to, to, and I think it's important for the international community to find ways to ensure that those Russians, particularly in the civil society, uh, journalists and other actors have the capacity to continue to be able to do their work from outside of Russia. And I think it's really important that the West and all allies and partners, including in Asia, are taking very serious kind of um, sanctions implementation. You know, we've seen the United States has announced this klepto capture initiative, but more intelligence sharing, more collective efforts to ensure that we are implementing the sanctions, that we're hunting down the assets of oligarchs so that they do truly feel the kind of pinch and the bite of the, of the international sanctions. So those are just a few, but I know Carl's gonna have other brilliant ideas. <laughs> So uh, with, with, with that um, high expectation set for you, uh, Kale, if you could take us out and I'll have uh, a minute or two at the end. So a minute or two for you, my friend. Yeah, uh, and I can be fairly brief. Uh, of course, there's more that will be happening on the sanction side. Uh, I, we've all been surprised by all of the decisions that been, steps have been taken by different governments. I've even more been surprised by the steps taken by business itself. Uh, making business with and in Russia is now toxic. That means that every company is now, by its own decisions, leaving Russia. Be that BP or be that IKEA or be that Microsoft or whatever. Uh, th there's an exodus that will hurt. And the visibility of that exodus is going to be fairly obvious. Um, so that's, that, will be, that, that will be significant. Just one fact that I think is striking in and closing down all IKEA stores is we don't have any air links with Russia at the moment. There's nothing. You can't fly to the place, you can't get out of the place, which is a problem that we're having now with both Russians that want to go home, that are stranded in the West, and uh, us taking out people, because we, we now want to take out people for Russia. It's getting too, too, too dangerous. Um, we need to beef up support for Ukraine. That's both militarily. We've discussed that. And let me stress again the financial um, of course, the Ukrainian economy is, to put it very mildly, not in the best of shape. We need to supply the so sustain it. Um, third, the diplomatic. Uh, Kevin, uh, I leave China to you. That's going to be critical. I would mention India. India has been sitting on the fence, abstaining in the votes, both uh, both in the Security Council, I think, the on Security Council, but but in the General Assembly, Putin has been talking to Modi twice, I think. It's a question of sort of Indian students that he wants to get out of the country. I can understand that. So the consul issues, but there's more to it. And I think that is put into question also according to these different things that have been discussed in the Asian context. So India, I think, is um, needs more attention. Uh, South Africa is another fence city that needs more diplomatic attention. Well, thank um, my thanks to all three of you. A concluding thought just about Asia. Uh, to the extent that it's um, uh, valuable uh, to the contribution each of you have made on what is happening intrinsically within Ukraine and more broadly with Europe. My analysis of China for what it's worth is this. Number one, Xi Jinping knew there was going to be a significant military operation. I do not buy this argument that the Chinese were caught uh, by surprise. Number two, Xi Jinping uh, and the Chinese establishment um, took the Russian advice that this would be short and sharp whatever it was going to be. Three, there is, I think, a degree of shock setting in across the Chinese political establishment about what an ungodly mess this has turned out to be on the ground militarily and in terms of the civilian loss of life. 
uh, for um, the point which a number of you have made, and Andrea most recently, is China places enormous priority on its relationships with Brussels and with Berlin in particular. Uh, and it's not just trade and economy, it's basically a long-term strategy to eventually soften the Europeans, to peel them away from the Americans. It's been undergoing, undergone for the last 10 years. This radically cuts across all of that. Therefore, the leverage which Brussels has, and Berlin in particular, given the extraordinary statement by Olaf Schulz in the Bundestag about the future of German security policy, leverage from Germany and the, and the European Union now in their direct communications with Xi Jinping and China on the Ukraine question is, I believe, critical. They have a lot of leverage, more than the Americans, more than the Japanese, more than the Asian allies, because their positions vis-a-vis -vis China are seen as predictable. Uh, the European position is a new dynamic. And the final thing is this, uh, if from a Chinese perspective, there is an active internal discussion and debate about the risk which China faces in terms of secondary financial sanctions should China assist in undermining the existing sanctions imposed by the West against Moscow. So I think um, the China dimension, I think, is live, um, but the leverage points um, come out of um, both Brussels and Berlin, and to a lesser extent, touching on the India point raised by Carl, from the G77, given the extraordinary uh, show of G77 support for the resolution in the UN General Assembly the other day, 147 votes. That's not just Europeans. That's not just Westerners. It's a whole bunch of other people across Africa, Latin America and everywhere else, which our friends in Beijing thought were stitched up uh, from a Chinese perspective. That in terms of China's claim to international political leadership in the future as the anchors of the new UN system, um, through the community of common destiny for all humankind, Xi Jinping's uh, mega concept for the alternative order to that run by the United States, uh, frankly starts to look a bit ragged in the wind uh, with uh, China's posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia to date. So that would be my concluding reflections on the, uh, the Beijing dimension to this. Can I simply say in conclusion on behalf of the Asia Society and to all our centres in the world, um, through uh, our centre in Tokyo, Seoul, uh, Hong Kong, as well as our centres in Sydney and Melbourne, in Delhi, Delhi and Mumbai and in Zurich and now in Paris, uh, together with our centres in San Francisco, Los Angeles and Houston, Washington, D.C., and of course our mothership in New York. Thank you very much, uh, Radek Sikorsky. Uh, you've been busy, very busy of late. And uh, we wish you well on your work in the European Parliament. Uh, Andrea, uh, Kendall Taylor, thank you for your expertise. We really do value it and the value of, uh, of analysis. And Carl, uh, global citizen extraordinaire and Swede from time to time, uh, thank you for your uh, contribution to this discussion as well. It's been very important for us and I believe uh, to the democracies of Asia as well. Thank you.